Good morning, church. I don't know how I follow that. I need to do some praying after that one. <laughs> hey, how many of you know you can have fun and come to church? So do me a favor, just real quick, if you haven't done it already, just smile to the person next to you. You don't have to say anything. Just give him a big old smile. Let him know you're glad to see him this morning. And uh, it's just good to be in God's house today, no matter what the weather. I love that last song, the best is yet to come. You believe that today? Man, thank the Lord that no matter what we're going through, we have hope. And we have a reason to get up in the morning and take another step because God is good and God is faithful. And we're starting a brand new message series today that I'm excited about. And uh, my prayer is that it's going to challenge us. You know, scripture says something pretty interesting. It says, Paul writes this actually, and he says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. How many of you know that the world has a pattern? The world has a way of thinking, and the world has a way of doing things. And part of what this message series is about is to remind us of what the pattern of this world is, of how people think and how people address certain topics and certain issues. But then Paul writes something else right after that. He says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. But he says what? Be transformed. I think that's why we're here today. And I think really, honestly, that's one of the reasons that we want to follow God. We want our life to be different. We want our life to be transformed in some way, don't we? And so Paul clues us in on how transformation happens. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That the way we think about life, the way we see life, it shapes us. And so what we believe absolutely 100% does matter. And so this series, uh, it, it may not give us warm and fuzzies. I'm just going to say that up front. But I really believe that this series has the potential to transform our mind and to bring about change in our life. How many of you know this, that every message has a starting point and a beginning? Do, do you realize that? That's true of any message. So not only the message that I'm giving today, but if you go home and turn on the news, that message has a starting point, a place of beginning. The same is true if you go to the, con uh, if you go to the coffee house and have a conversation with someone. That conversation, that message that they're going to share with you, it has a starting point. It has a beginning point. And, and I say that to say this, that the Bible is no exception. The Bible has a starting point. The Bible has a beginning point. If you grew up in church, then you know that the beginning point of Scripture is the book we call Genesis. Because Genesis means beginnings. It's the place where things start. Now, I also want to say this because I acknowledge this and understand this, that as we begin to talk about Genesis, it's controversial. You just need to know that. There are things that Genesis talks about that people don't want to hear. They, they don't want to accept it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to believe it. And so here's what's happening today. Because people don't want to accept the message of Genesis, here's what's happening. Academia is trying to replace the history of Genesis with the history of evolutionary science. That's what's happening. And so I think it's only fair to you to say this today. You have to understand where I'm coming from. You have to understand my point of view. And I say this unashamedly. I, I say this with 100% confidence that when it comes to the Bible, I believe it's 100% accurate, true, and reliable. Amen. That I believe that it was written by men, but it was inspired through the Holy Spirit. And so the words that we have on the page are actually the very words of God. Amen. And the words of God have no expiration date. So God's word is applicable no matter what generation or time period we live in, because truth is truth. And, th and that's where I'm coming from. That's, that's my angle this morning. I just want to share that up front. And then I also want to share this today too because it's not being talked about. But I think we need to address this issue real carefully but, but quickly. 
and say this, that evolution is not a science. It is a religion. Right. You, you need to hear my heart this morning. Evolution is a religion. And some of you may say, well, how can you say that, Pastor? Well, here's why. Because it is a systematic approach to indoctrinate people. That's what evolution is. And if you look through the history of mankind, you see religion at work. And here's the other facts that I give to you. Why do I say it's a religion? Because it's doing everything that it can to indoctrinate our children. And, and you may think, well, well, how can you say that? Well, how did the Nazi party start? One of the ways that the Nazi party started is Hitler spread propaganda to children. And those children grew up believing that the Nazi way was the way to go. You think about Islam. They have a systematic approach that once a child is born to indoctrinate them into their religion. So evolution is not a science. It's not a just harmful or harmless kind of a thing. It is a religion. And I think we see the effects of this religion today in our society. Because now we have a group of young people, we call them millennials, but they've grown up in school settings where evolution has been taught. And what is one of the, the messages of, of evolution? We're, we're animals. And so why are people treating people the way that they're treating people today? Because they're nothing but animals. I mean, think about it. If, you're, if your pet is sick, you take them into the vet and you put them down. We are killing and murdering millions and millions and millions of babies. Amen. And we think to ourselves, well, how can that happen? Well, because they're animals. It's nothing more than just going to the vet and getting rid of your, of your pet. Because you either don't want it or it's sick. Hear me. Evolution is a religion. And that's why they fight so hard against scripture and against Genesis. And so I figured, let's talk about this. Let, let's look at our world today from a different perspective and a different point of view. How about we stop looking at world from a humanist point of view and we start looking at it from a, a God kind of view. Amen. I think that would clear some things up. I, I, I think that would, would shed some light in the darkness. How, what do you think about that? And so let me tell you why Genesis matters, why it's important, why we want to go through this series for the next couple of weeks. And the first reason Genesis is important is because it's the foundation of the gospel. I mean, I want you to know this. If, if Adam did not sin and bring death into the world, then Jesus would not have needed to come to save us. I mean, why did Jesus come? Because of Adam. Let, let's just, we like to blame people. Let's blame him. Man, you messed it up for all of us. But scripture says that. It says through, through one man, death came into the world. But then it says through the second Adam... Life came into the world. Who's the second Adam? It's Jesus. See, if the first Adam hadn't messed it up, the second Adam, Jesus, wouldn't have needed to come. So Genesis is the foundation of the gospel. Here's the other reason it's important. is because Genesis is the solution for culture. Now here's a, just a slight definition of what culture is. Culture is the way that people choose to order their lives. It's, it's a decision that people make that I'm going to live my life this way. That's what culture is. And what I love about Genesis is that God shows us how we should order our lives. God shows us the meaning and purpose of life, how we should live our life. And if we live according to his way, life has so much more joy and purpose and meaning behind it. And so Genesis is the solution for our culture. And then Genesis just answers the most basic human questions. I mean, we all have questions. And some of the most basic questions that people have is, where did I come from? 
Why am I here? Where am I going? You hear this a lot too. Why is there evil in the world? And other people ask the question, if there is a God, does he really care about me? Does, does he really see me and notice me? And so Genesis is a very important book. And I love Genesis because it tells us where we came from. And it tells us why we're here. I mean, you look at scripture, we were made by God. And we're going to talk more about that next week. But we were made by God. I, I say this a lot of times, but we're not a oops. We're not a mistake. My ancestor doesn't live in the zoo. <laughs> I come from God. The Bible says that he knew me and formed me in my mother's womb. So I'm made by God. You're made by God. And we were put on this earth to know God and to serve God. So, so why are we here? We're here to know God. To have a relationship with him. But maybe even more than that, we're here to serve him. We're, we're here to love him. Because here's what serving does. When we enter into this relationship with God, when we serve God, that's where we find meaning and purpose and satisfaction and fulfillment and self-worth. It's found in that relationship with God. Maybe another way of saying it is this. If you, if you want to live a happy life or be happier, then you need to know about God. Because the more we know about God, the happier we'll be. That, that's just a, that's true. I mean, how, how can you be happy? Because you know God. I mean, he changes my outlook on life, doesn't he? Even if things aren't great and rosy. I, I know I'm not an accident. I, I know my life has meaning and purpose behind it. I, I'm, I'm here for a reason. That, that's freeing. That's good news. And so we're going to go through Genesis today. And we're going to start in this place today. Genesis chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles today, hopefully you don't have to look real long, look real far. First book of the Bible. Alright? Very first book in the Old Testament. The book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. And let me just say while you're finding your place there, there's a reason that we're going to start here. And the reason, I believe, is this, is because the way we interact with this scripture determines how we interact with the rest of the Bible. I, I say it to you this way. What we believe about this verse is going to determine how we respond to the rest of the Bible. If we struggle with this verse, we're going to struggle with the rest of the Bible. L let me just say to you this way. If I struggle with the fact that God created the world then I'm certainly going to struggle in a couple weeks when we celebrate Easter and a dead person came back to life again. I, I mean, if my God could not create the world, how could he raise somebody to the life again? I mean, how I, how I believe this verse, it determines how I approach the rest of the Bible and how I look at my world and see my world and interpret things that are happening in the world today. So Genesis chapter 1 Verse number one. Some of you might be able to quote this by heart, but here's what it says. It says, in the beginning, God created. Let me pause for dramatic effect. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Meaning, it did not exist. Oh, we're going to get to that in a minute. But if that didn't just blow your mind, it will. When, when you catch up with me, I know you got one less hour of sleep. So some of you, you're, you're trying to focus today. I get that. I'm with you. But the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now again, I think it's only fair to let you know where I come from, my, my point of view, okay? I believe that as we look at this creation story today, and I'm going to summarize it for you instead of reading all the verses, but I believe that our world was created in six literal days. Six 24-hour periods of time. 
That God didn't start the world and then all of a sudden millions of years later we had light. And then millions of years later there was vegetation and there were seas. I, I don't believe that. And, and some people will say this, well pastor isn't there proof though that the world's millions of years old? I mean they prove it don't they? And my response to that would be no I disagree with that. And the reason why is because anybody can go outside today, pick up a rock, and slap a date on it. Because hear me, why can I say that? Because every message has a starting point. I mean, if evolutionary science were really trying to figure out where we came from, they, they wouldn't argue so hard with people that have different points of view. Because it is a religion. I just want you to get that. It is a religion. It is an indoctrination. Because it's trying to conform us to the pattern of this world. But let me just remind you, when God created you, he created you to break the mold. He created you not to be like everybody else and not to think like everybody else. He created you to be unique, to be special, to serve him and to know him. Oh, I know it's quiet today. That's okay. <laughs> but day one, picture this. God spoke it, and there was light. Day two, God speaks, and he creates the sky and the water. Day three, God creates, and there's land, there's seas, and there's vegetation. Day four, God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day five, God created fish and birds. Day six, God created land animals. And then he created mankind, people. And then on day seven, the Bible says that God rested. And understand he wasn't taking a nap, chilling. What that means is that everything he started off to create, he created it and he was done. I, I did what I started to do. I created this world, this universe. And now I can move on. He rested. So why is this important? Or maybe another way of saying this is what is Genesis 1? What does it have to say to us today? And I think it says this, first of all, that the universe had a definite beginning. I mean, the Bible clearly says, in the beginning. And what that's referring to is the beginning of all created things. All right, I know that's hard for us because we look at history linear, right? Or a lot of people look at it circular. It just goes around. What goes around comes around. That, that's how a lot of people look at it. But history's not circular, it's linear. And so when you have a line, you have a beginning point, and you have an ending point. And the reason that's important is because what we have to begin to realize and understand is that matter is not eternal. See, everything that we can see consists of matter. It consists of particles that have come together. So the trees that you see that we are so desperately waiting for them to turn green. Because that means we get to fall out. That consists of matter. Okay? So our cars, our matter. Are, are you tracking with me today? Matter is not eternal. You have a glazed, on, you have a glazed look on your face today. Maybe let, I could say to you this way. The universe is not eternal. There was a time when the heavens and the earth did not exist. They weren't there. And I came across this quote. I love it. Because I know the question that you're thinking of. Well, if the universe came from nowhere or didn't have a beginning, did, how does God figure into this? And I came across this quote. It says, this raises the question that children like to ask and adults secretly wonder about. Who created God? And the answer is no one created God. 
He was there before the beginning. He had no beginning, and he did not create himself. He was, he is, and he always will be. God stretches back farther than the mind can imagine. He goes far beyond the reaches of chemistry or biology or history or mathematics or quantum mechanics or the speculations of theoretical cosmology. He dwells in eternity, which means no telescope can find him and no computer program can define him. But understand, the universe had a definite beginning. And let me just say this. I think science would agree with that. It, it came from somewhere. The problem is they don't know where. And they don't know how. But it had to come from somewhere. So the universe has a beginning. Genesis 1 also tells us this. That the universe was created by God out of nothing. Now let that sink in for a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that here in a minute. But that's pretty amazing. That takes a lot of faith. Let me just say that. To believe that God created something out of nothing. Now a lot of you grew up in mainline church. So this is not unfamiliar to you. You probably quoted this. I don't know if at the end of your services a lot of times. But there's a, there's, a, there's a creed out there that's called the Apostles' Creed. And in the Apostles' Creed, the first line of that goes like this. It says, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. And, and that's an amazing concept. That's a powerful thought. And I would say that that thought is anchored on Genesis 1.1. Because... When we look at this world, the world and everything in it was created by God. The universe and everything in it was created by God. Now here's what scientists will say. They estimate that there are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. They estimate that there are more than 100 billion galaxies, each with at least 100 billion stars. Now here's why I appreciate scripture. And I believe that it's true. Because Psalm 147 says this about God. That God counts the stars and he calls them by name. I mean if you came in here with a small view of God today. Just let that build your faith. If there's a hundred billion galaxies. And a hundred billion stars in those galaxies. And God knows them all by name. And he named them. And he flung them up into the sky. Oh man. He cares about you. And he loves you. That's amazing to me. <coughs> Psalm 19. We referenced this last week. But it says the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. I, I, I came across this quote again. Let me just share it with you. It says that the world is God's house. It says that he left clues everywhere about what kind of God he is. When you stand at the Grand Canyon, you can't help but be overwhelmed at the mighty power of God to create such magnificence. He must have had a mighty hand to scoop out the Royal Gorge in Colorado. He is as infinite as the dark recesses of the mighty Atlantic Ocean. Each snowflake testifies of his uniqueness. The changing colors of the great smoky mountains proclaim his creativity. The galaxies shout out, he is there. The wildflowers sing together, he is there. The rippling brooks join in, he is there. The birds sing it, the lions roar it, the fish write it in the oceans, he is there. All creation joins to sing his praise. The heavens declare it, the earth repeats it, and the wind whispers it. He is there. Deep cries to deep. The mighty sequoia tells it to the eagle who soars overhead. The lamb and the wolf agree on this one thing. He is there. No one can miss the message. God has left his fingerprints all over this world. Truly, this is my father's world. And every rock, every twig, every river, and every mountain bears his signature. 
He signed his name to everything he made. The earth is marked, made by God, in letters so big that no one fails to see it. Now here's the question. Well, how can you say that and how can you believe that? And let me just clue you in. Not only does every message have a beginning or a starting point, but every message you receive requires faith. Could we agree on that? Faith. And again, this is why I believe that the scriptures are inspired and they are true. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, here's what it says. It says, by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That, that what we see now did not come from anything that can be seen. Think about God. Only God can make something out of nothing. And so here's what Genesis 1-1 says to me. Here, here's what I believe we can hang our hat on today. Here's what I believe is true. I think when we read that verse, Genesis 1-1, it reminds us or tells us three things about God. Number one, God is. God is. I know I don't have to convince you of that. Hopefully I don't have to convince you of that. But there's a God. I think Genesis 1-1 tells us that God acts. See, contrary to belief of some people, God didn't begin the world and now he's sitting back waiting for things to unfold and happen. We serve a God who interacts with his world and interacts with creation. We serve a God who is personal. And that's so important for us to understand. And then the last thing Genesis 1-1 tells us is that God creates. Now here's the thing, only God creates. We can't create. We can make things, but we make things out of things that have already existed. So we make things, but only God creates. Now, because God's creator though, understand this, he's greater than his creation. And I think that's good news. I don't know how you look at it, but God being greater than his creation, that's good news to me. And here's why. It's because it tells me that nothing in my life is greater than God. There's no problem I will ever face that God cannot solve. God is not stumped by the things that stumped me. God is not baffled by the things that baffle me. And so the universe was created by God out of nothing. And then Genesis 1.1 says this, lastly, that all things owe their existence to God. Now here's the thing. Hopefully this will hit home today. Because God is creator, that means he owns everything. Now we got to hear that again. Okay, some things that are good, we need to hear it a second time, right? But if God is creator, that means he owns everything. And again, we're going to talk about this more next week, but I have to say this. If God created us, then he owns us. And scripture declares that. You were bought with a price. Meaning you don't belong to yourself. You don't own yourself. If you're a follower of Jesus, he owns you. Amen. And here's though why this is hard to take. And I think here's why some people buck against Genesis and, and just have a hard time believing in it and accepting it. It's because all of us as people have this desire inside of us to be free. All of us, we want to be free as people. Now here's where that differs though. We want to be free to do our own thing. And to live life however we want to live it. And we don't believe that anybody has the right to tell me what to do. Oh come on I'm preaching today. And I need some help. But we struggle with that right? I mean even as Christians we struggle with that. Who are you? 
telling me I can't park my car here? Who, who do you think you are? Who are you? And understand where that comes from. That's our human nature. We as people, we don't like to be told we're wrong. And we don't want people to say, you know what, there's maybe a different way of doing this. And so rather than agree with scripture, we try to discredit it and disprove it. And say that people who believe in scripture are stupid, they're dumb, they're ignorant. You've heard these things before. You're narrow-minded. Why? It's because I don't want to be told what to do. Now here's the thing though. If God created us, then we are accountable to him for what we do and what we say. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Because I know that even scripture declares that. When we, when we die, we will all stand before God in judgment. And we think, well, why would a loving God do that? Well, because he created us. And we are accountable to him. And it's no different in our earthly life. I mean, God forbid if my daughter at her age goes out and does something crazy. Guess who's accountable for that? Me, as her dad. Like, how could you let your daughter go out and do something like, like that, parent? You didn't know where they were. You didn't know what she was doing. You're accountable for that. Is that making sense? How we live our life, we're accountable to God for how we live our life. And I like what Martin Luther said. Some of you that like church history know that he began the Protestant Reformation. And it was about 450 years ago he nailed 99 theses on, on the door of a church. And that created a, a new movement and a new way of thinking. And Martin Luther says this. He says, I believe that God has created me and all that exists. That he has given and still preserves my body and soul, my eyes and ears and all my members, my reason and all the power of my soul, together with food and raiment home and family, and all my property, that he daily provides abundantly for all the needs of my life, protects me from all danger, and guards and keeps me from all evil, and that he does this purely out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy, without any merit of worthiness in me, for all which I am in duty bound to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. This is most certainly true. Is that powerful? That all things owe their existence to God. And so again, how, how we approach Genesis 1-1, it determines how we look at the rest of Scripture. The universe had a definite beginning. The universe was created by God out of nothing. And all things owe their existence to God. So here's what I want to leave you with. If God is creator, then how should I respond to him? What should I think about that? How, how should my life go? And I, I would say this to you. That if God's creator, then our hearts should bow. I mean, I, I think we could all agree that, the, that this world is beautiful. There are parts of creation that are just breathtaking that are just almost hard to comprehend they're, they're just so unique and special and amazing and I think what that should say to us is that when we see creation we should be in awe of God I mean we don't worship creation but we should worship the one who created it and, and when we look at the amazing world around us, the world that we get to enjoy, that God put us in, man, we should just be in awe of him. And, and our hearts should bow to him. When it comes to God, we should just be filled with wonder. And we should just be filled with astonishment and amazement. Can, can I proclaim to you that as followers of Christ and even as adults, let, let's regain our wonder of God. Let's just be astonished once again at how amazing he really is and how his love for us is just pure and perfect and overwhelming. I mean, let's bow our hearts to him. And then I think of God's creator, our knees should bend. Think about this. Meaning, we should acknowledge God. 
And we should listen to what God says. I mean, if, if God outlined a solution for culture and the way we live our life, a, a wise person would listen to that. A wise person would step back and think, you know what, I don't know everything about everything. But I do know there is someone who knows everything about everything. And I should probably listen to what he has to say. I mean, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? But yet, as people, we fight that so often. We fight it. Let's bow our knees to God, right? Our, we, our wills should, ye, should yield to God. How many of you know we have a will? We have a will. And, and you know what I say? Our, our wills should yield to God. That means that there are times where we should abandon our plans. We think we know what's best. And we think we, should, we know the direction that we're going in. But we need to bend or bow our wills to God. And say, God, I, I abandon my plans. And I just put my life and everything that you've given me into your hands. And, and here's what I know. That you know what's best for me. I, I really believe that you know what's best for me. So I yield to you. I defer to you. Now let me just speak to the guys for a minute. Guys that are married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When anybody asks you a question about the calendar, you say this. Well, let me talk to my wife first. I, I need to defer to my wife first. Right? We do that. Well, how much more should we do that with God? God, I defer to you. I I want to do what you have called me to do. So my will, my plans, I yield them to you. And then I think the last thing we should do is our minds should worship. I mean, when we look at this world and acknowledge God and acknowledge that he has a plan that's good for us, then that means that we should live a life that's faithful to him. We should live a life that is completely dedicated and committed to God. That God's not just a part of our life, that he is our life. And he's the center of our life, that he's our all in all, he is our everything. How many of you know when we can live life that way, that's where you find purpose and satisfaction. That's where you find out who you really are. We live in a world today that people don't know who they are. And that should break our heart. Because there's a God who loves them and created them and who wants them to have a relationship with him. Everything they're looking for is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm here to say that's good news.